Hey bees. this is Zach Settle coming to you from an unknown and new time space. I am in isolation, um, but Sammy and Sally have asked that we continue doing the Lenten Formation class, which makes good sense, so we're going to try it in a virtual manner. This is going to be obviously less conversational than if we... Um, we're all in the same room together, and that's fine and dandy. If you have any pressing questions, you can find my contact info in the directory. Feel free to reach out, and I'll try and help you work through whatever questions come up. We are going to post the videos and the outlines alike, so be sure you have those. Um, I'm still working through the same outline, and hopefully it'll be helpful for you to watch the video in conjunction with the outline. So, given that we skipped a week last week. I want to do a brief review on the front end um, to hit a couple of themes that are going to be really important for today's chapters. Today, this is part three of five, so today we are going to be talking through chapters six through eight. Next week we'll do chapters nine and ten. If you have time, um, it'd be great to read those ahead of this. If you have to pick one chapter, Chapter 9 is the one to focus on, I think, but Chapter 10 is pretty wild, too. Um, so, yeah, you make the call as you are able to, and um, hopefully you can still tune in and participate, even if you've not done any of the reading. I'll try and help you get a good overview. But first, a little bit of review. The first thing that's worth highlighting is the apocalyptic nature of this for Rutledge, which is to say that the intervention that happens on the cross of the crucifixion of Jesus is less about God reckoning with your individualized isolated sins and more about God's cosmic address to the collective semi-autonomous powers of death and sin which are uh, your sins are downstream from you are um, participating in and stuck with those kinds of powers. Um, and God's apocalyptic address is the ways in which, or is the means through which you are freed from the power of sin. So it's a sort of a liberative uh, motif or theme in that sense. But the biggest picture for the apocalyptic stuff is that it's God's massive historical address to evil, sin, and death. So, um, much less of an individualized way of thinking about it, though it has massive connotations for each of us as individuals. It also has massive connotations for us collectively. And remember, too, that in the second half of the text, Rutledge is going motif by motif. So um, each chapter is a different motif, and it's basically going to be her highlighting... Um, the cluster of themes that are traced throughout the New Testament. And she wants to take those like a bouquet in the end to say that in order to get at the crucifixion, we've got to understand each of these themes uh, in relation to one another. The first motif, this is the one that we briefly didn't get to in, um, in week two, was the Passover and the Exodus. And she's mainly concerned with uh, highlighting the ways in which the cross represents deliverance from bondage. So it's one of the one of the ways in which Christ is addressing the problem of capital S sin and your lowercase s sins as they participate in the bigger force. There's a long-standing theme of uh, in the, the Hebrew scriptures of God setting God's people free and intervening in oppressive structures and practices and times. And um, with the Passover and Exodus motif, Rutledge is trying to say that same thing gets done in the New Testament by way of the crucifixion. So that's review stuff. Our first motif today, which is chapter 6, is the blood sacrifice. It's the second motif, and uh, it, she's really concerned here with trying to emphasize an overview and theorize <clears throat> excuse me, the ongoing importance of the church and uh, the New Testament's blood and imagery. It's all over the New, Te the New Testament, she says. On page 233, 
She writes, quote, the motif of sacrifice, especially blood sacrifice, is central to the story of our salvation through Jesus Christ. And without that theme, the Christian proclamation loses much of its power, becoming both theological and ethically undernourished, quote. So she's going to talk a good bit about sacrifice, and she's going to try and rework it for reasons that we'll talk about, but she ultimately wants to uh, preserve it. There's been a large, uh, many criticisms for uh, some really profound and helpful reasons about the concept of sacrifice and its socio-political implications. Rutledge has a kind of way of reading that to take it seriously and still preserve it. Um, so it will be up to you to determine whether or not you find that uh, helpful and successful. But I'll try and articulate some of that stuff as we go. She's thinking mainly about two, there's two components to the concept of sacrifice. One is that something of value has to be relinquished, and two, it has to be relinquished in order to receive a greater good. And the problem, she says, is when we neglect that second component. It's not really sacrifice if you're just giving away something valuable in return for nothing. You're ultimately receiving a greater good, and she wants to preserve both of those things. This matters for Rutledge in that she she sees Jesus positioning himself as an efficacious sacrifice for all of humanity and for all of the world. This is like in the big apocalyptic sense. So she goes back to the sin offerings in Leviticus, and she's trying to make the claim that God has provided the means for continual restoration for folks in the midst of their sin sinfulness. Even in the Leviticus sin offerings and the parallel between that and the crucifixion of Jesus is that God is the one who ordained the way in which justice and mercy would be enacted for the sins of the world. She sees that being pretty clear in 1 John 2. So God itself becomes what she calls the halasmos, is the Greek term, it's the expiation or propitiation for the uh, sins of the world. She's also intrigued by the like various um, syntactic, I guess would be the proper term, syntactic forms that sacrifice can take. So it can be verbal and it could be a noun. And she thinks this is significant in that Jesus doesn't merely offer a sacrifice. Jesus becomes the sacrifice that God gives. So it's rather than God giving over Jesus as separate entities, um, which... This is another one of the popular criticisms around atonement theory um, and the crucifixion is that it's possible to phrase this logic or relationship in a way that sounds like divine child abuse of like, oh, I'm, I am frustrated and someone has to die. Uh, the father will now slay the son in order to atone for the sins of the world. And that sounds like a, an inappropriate kind of uh, familial relationship, Rutledge wants to say. It's not that. Um, it is actually Jesus becoming, uh, both giving the offering and being the offering himself, which is different. Um, she's also really looking at John 17 and the high priestly prayer to substantiate this kind of reading of both noun and verb of the sacrifice. I think the chapter gets most interesting when she's talking about these recent criticisms of the concept of sacrifice. So she's particularly looking at feminist and womanist theologians who are pushing back. This has probably been the last 30 years. Um, women, women of color uh, who are doing religious scholarship, theological discourse have um, started to criticize in this period the idea of redemptive suffering, um, particularly as it pertains to the crucifixion. Rutledge, I think, is actually pretty right about the criticisms. Uh, on This is a, a helpful quote to summarize them on page 272. She says, There's plenty of, uh, there's presently an intense reaction rooted in women's experience against the whole concept of sacrifice. This is one of the most important challenges to the theology of sacrifice. And in some quarters, it's now being taken with great seriousness. 
It's argued that women have traditionally been the ones to assume a disproportionate amount of sacrificing. Many women have been conditioned to think that they have no choices except to be ignored, patronized, exploited, and abused. This has been disabling for women, profoundly so in many cases, and it's part of the work of the church in our time to rethink the whole matter. Quote, so um, I think the idea is that given the patriarchal norms that operate within our world and that uh, have structured society as Christian theology and history is basically developed, it's developed in these kind of patriarchal societies, not kind of, and this leads, uh, so that she basically says that the concept of sacrifice falls in an overly burdened way on women. And you might have the, what we would call the theologic or the religious logic ideas. And because of the placement of women and different women having different experiences across these, um, the social stratosphere structures, it's uh, common, hyper common, for the logic of sacrifice to basically substantiate or legitimize these kind of oppressive, divisive practices, societal divisions, all of that sort of stuff. At its simplest, this would be uh, like undue uh, oppressions, demands, expectations falling on women, and those demands being legitimized by way of this Christian logic of sacrifice. Relich wants to say that's actually uh, not what sacrifice is supposed to do, even though it historically does that. Because remember, there's those two parts. You have to give something, but you also have to receive something greater. And when sacrifice is legitimating and or legitimizing and maintaining patriarchy, it's only asking women to keep giving things. It's not a system or societal arrangement wherein they gain something much larger. So that's the criticism. <clears throat> and nonetheless, Rutledge thinks that um, that boils down to a largely aesthetic response. She also wants to say that a more, like a carefully articulated, broader understanding of sacrifice can resolve the issue. Um, this, I'm not quite convinced of this, but I'm open to you finding it more helpful. Um, it, it's going to be a theme I think that we'll loop back to in chapter or in the, in our last session to talk about um, like some criticisms I have or questions I have about the text. Um, it'll be interesting to see if you find this more persuasive than I do. And to be fair for Rillage, she does suggest that whenever a sacrificial trope is negatively used for the sake of repression, that it has to be resisted and condemned because it's not real sacrifice. That's great. Um, but she says that we can't simply toss out sacrifice. We have to rethink it in terms of power so as to more properly avoid its current associations with weakness and abjection and a maintenance of um, bad social practices and divisions. She says that power comes in two forms. There's good and bad. And the sacrificial life that's modeled in Jesus it still is a kind of sacrifice. It's still a kind of sacrifice that trades in power, um, but it is uh, liberating and freeing rather than marked by objection. She thinks it's characteristically true of the New Testament's treatment of sacrifice, um, and she demonstrates this by tying sacrifice into the apocalyptic treatment of the crucifixion. She sees a lot of these connections being held together in Paul. So on page 274, she writes, Paul understood the crucifixion as the definitive apocalyptic engagement with the forces of the enemy at the frontier of the ages where Jesus' self-abandonment was the ultimate weapon. It was the ultimate form of the passive resistance that overwhelms and routs the enemy. Quote. So all of this way of phrasing sacrifice she thinks leads to a direct address of the old world forms of legalism and repression that feminist theologians, feminists in general, are rightly criticizing and frustrated about. So Rutledge thinks 
the criticism stands, this poor way of thinking about sacrifice, what we might call sacrifice one, is constantly legitimating and perpetuating um, oppression, repression, bad social practices. And Rutledge thinks the strategy for overcoming this is not to just toss sacrifice altogether. It's to come up with sacrifice two. So to retool the concept of sacrifice where it actually contests the, um, the poor forms, the poor practices of sacrifice one. Okay, so that's the blood sacrifice chapter. That's chapter six. In chapter seven, uh, with ransom and redemption, it's a whole new motif. So she's basically going to start over with uh, a new theme here. She's really interested in toying around between the boundaries and divisions of redemption and ransom. And she's going to examine the concept of redemption by way of ransom. So she wants to uh, see whether or not these ideas refer to a price that is paid or a general deliverance. And the question again is, does God giving Jesus over on the cross in this brutal death, is that a debt that is being paid by way of God's self? Or is this the means through which a, a much larger cosmic deliverance happens. She wants to prioritize the cosmic deliverance, though the priciness of it she still wants to preserve. So she's going to give us kind of a both and uh, in this chapter. There's a, a long history of folks analyzing and thinking about courtroom language in the New Testament and how, what that might have to do with the atonement. Um, she notes the oh and, and ransom language too the ransom language if i am underqualified to explain trace these histories but my very loose understanding of it is that ransom uh, language is much more popular in the early patristic and medieval era and then in light of the reformation a lot of like the courtroom legal focus language stuff becomes much more dominant but don't quote me on that because that might be a really unhelpful characterization. She Rutledge does note the frequency of ransom language and how um, scattered it is throughout the patristics in the Middle Ages. She wants to re receive this in kind of uh, like the in a metaphor or in the form of a parable. There's truths communicated here, but the the literal rendition of those truths, the factness of it, is not um, what needs to be prioritized, right? It's like when we read the parables of Jesus, we're not trying to figure out like who, which field is it that this uh, treasure is actually buried in, right? What's what is the kind of precious metal that these treasures are supposed to be that we're selling everything to go buy and dig up, right? There's a truth communicated about what those um, ideas represent, but the literal factness of it, of the story, is not what the truth, or where the truth is actually hidden. This is, I just have um, Colbert's use of the term truthiness running through my mind here, so maybe, maybe we need to focus on the truthiness of Ransom rather than uh, the literal image of uh, God paying a price and paying off the devil so as to free us. In the end, Rutledge is going to argue that uh, understanding redemption requires treating it as both a general deliverance from these cosmic forces, but it's a deliverance at a cost. That's the truthiness of the ransom, is that it's a costly kind of deliverance. And removing the idea of cost basically has bad connotations for Rutledge. If we stop thinking about this being costly to God, then there's a way of distancing God from our own present. But the costliness demonstrates to us how involved God gets, right? The cross, this, this is why, as we talked about in the week one, the m mode of the crucifixion matters for Rutledge. It's bad and it's brutal. It's like as abject as it, it can get. And that cost shows how intimately involved God becomes with the world.
This is not something that God just like snaps God's metaphorical fingers and resolves. There's a pretty intense cost in order to rectify the situation. And that's what Rutledge wants to hold on to with the idea of ransom. Um, let's see. I, I feel pretty good about that uh, ransom and redemption bit. Uh, she wants to say that we can't phrase this ransom as a new change of plan as well. This isn't, it's, it is bad theology, Rutledge thinks, for us to say that God suddenly caught off guard with the conditions of sin and is like doing this massive improvisational thing and is like, well, I guess I'll have to send Jesus and uh, maybe the cross. She wants to say that God's response follows the pattern of self-giving love that is essential to God and that is pre-temporal or atemporal, which means that it's not a new thing. Maybe the, the specific conditions of, of Jesus on the cross um, is the new instantiation. It's like the new medium, but where the same old practices and relations and ideas are played out. God, uh, God exists in itself as self-giving love. God has always existed that way, even before there was the world or before there was time. Traditionally, time and the world are said to come into existence at creation. God um, is the thing that gives being to those in a perpetual sense. God also was prior to the act of creation in this timeless, spaceless sense. Maybe book four of the Confessions, or maybe it's book seven, I don't remember, where Augustine is um, just infatuated and mystified and in love and horrified with the idea it's like of what God was doing prior to time and space. But Rutledge wants to say, even in that state or that non-momentary moment, God is existing in these self-giving ways of relating, and it's that same kind of relating that plays out in the conditions of sin and history in the world, and what that looks like in the moment that Jesus is born and killed is the crucifixion. But it's not a new thing in that sense. So, at the end of the chapter, this is page 302, she argues, quote, the redemption wrought by God in Christ was indeed a mighty deliverance and points ahead to the glorious future of the reign of God. The ransom imagery reminds us that this great liberation involved not only a loosing from bondage, but also an atonement for sin. Not only a cosmic victory, but also an ultimate price. The cost of our redemption was the crucifixion of the Son of God. Otherwise, we can't find a place within our understanding for the sheer horror and godlessness of such a death. Quote, I think that's a pretty helpful summary of all the things that Relig is trying to hold together. She is going to say it is a great liberation, a loosing from bondage, and it's also the ways in which your participation in those powers are atoned for. All right, so thirdly, or maybe the last section for us today, it's more, a more helpful way to phrase it, is chapter 8, The Great Assize, or Assize. I don't actually know how you pronounce this word, so um, I hope those of you who do are able to chuckle it off at home. Um, this is where the law court imagery comes up for Rutledge. She says that it is actually way less prioritized and common in the New Testament than the apocalyptic imagery, and yet it it's, plays an important part, and it is pretty present. Y'all check out this mug. My mom and dad, my mom's name is Kim, and they have these matching cups from like 1985, and it's the greatest little mug in the world. Um, yeah, so the, the law court imagery is both present and important, and when we see it from the perspective of the end, the or the eschaton, or like Jesus' return, and like the final instantiation of all of the stuff that gets kicked off in the crucifixion, um, the binary of guilty and innocent kind of crumbles. 
And that binary is what the law court language is ultimately concerned about, the way that we talk about law court language in the New Testament. Are you guilty? Or are you innocent? And what is the way in which you are moved from one category to the other? Relish wants to say, by the time we get to the end, the categories don't actually hold. There is, after all, no one righteous, she says. We are all in bondage to these forces that are way bigger than any individual. And so she's going to kind of undo that those categories of guilty innocent by way of the apocalyptic promise of God's judgment over the powers and the full instantiation of God's king, coming kingdom. The powers are defeated in the crucifixion and the um, in Christ's return, uh, the that the dominoes are basically like, all knocked over and the fullness of God's kingdom is made present and those powers are like definitively um, done in a way that's kicked off in the crucifixion and finalized in Christ's return. So she wants to say that the day of the Lord's return or the day of the Lord contrasts with and confronts our present. That's why the forensic imagery shouldn't be allowed to overshadow the apocalyptic, apocalyptic motifs. She says on 346, quote, the declaration in the courtroom of not guilty is properly grasped only when we recognize that the categories of guilt and innocence simply don't exist as such in the new age of God, but they're rendered meaningless by the apocalyptic gospel of the justification of the ungodly. Quote, in Christ's return, when the powers of sin and death are established, there's no more participation in those powers, like they're gone. So the verdict of guilty um, is, it becomes like a fundamentally illogical kind of thing. We thus need to not overemphasize it's like salvific importance for us right now. And even now in the midst of like, we're sort of in the in-between time between the crucifixion on the one hand and the return on the other hand. And this is like the Pauline now, but not yet stuff. Even now, Relich thinks God's work God is at work in invisible and transforming ways. Um, like It's playing out historically, even if slowly, so it seems. So all of this matters for Rutledge in that she's going to try and phrase the reconciliation that gets done on the cross within the larger category of uh, justification. She says, although signs of reconciliation in this life are always proleptic parables, of what God will do, proleptic just mean like their meaning and is bound up with or grounded in some future coming thing. Uh, all those signs of reconciliation in this life are always proleptic parables of what God will do, and therefore um, much to be sought. Its fulfillment is a work of the end time, the gift of the judge who is to come in the greatest seas. So. This is justification and reconciliation as part and parcel of the larger apocalyptic struggle. And the justification is less about my being granted the, the formal category of innocence, and it's more about this coming judgment and freedom and like overthrow of the powers in Christ's return. So on 347, it's a helpful summary of, of um, the greatest seas and the emphasis and logic of all this stuff. She says, the imagery of rescue and victory places the themes of reconciliation and forgiveness into another context altogether, where they're brought in under the heading of God acting to make right what has been wrong, rectification. Then and only then can the whole complex of ideas and images be located where it belongs, on the battlefield of Christ against the powers. Quote, Forgiveness and reconciliation are not the end goals themselves. They are part of the effects, um, even if they're like intended and good and necessary for us. They are part and parcel. Uh, the, they are like the immediate outcomes of God's larger um, address against the powers of sin and death in and through Jesus Christ. And that is our baseline reconciliation and forgiveness stem from the larger address. So again, she's saying it's all here, but what we emphasize matters. And like the stories we tell ourselves about this particular event are very much going to structure the rest of our theological systems. So 
we would typically have opened it up to questions uh, along the way and insights and connections. Um, but we're going to pause here. Feel free to be in touch with me if you need. And uh, if you can, read along chapters 9 and 10 next week. And we will go from there. See you all soon. I hope everyone stays and remains healthy and well.